You would love being an Air Force pilot. It is more fun than you can ever imagine. But some days there's a little pressure involved, not unlike the pressures you face today. New rules, new regulations, tighter budgets, just the stress of the job. Like many of you, I come from a background of pressure over two decades, a Fortune 50 company where we had to make the numbers this year, this week. I've been an entrepreneur. Now, for those of you that have ever been an entrepreneur, you know one of the key aspects there is, where are we going to eat tomorrow? And most importantly, who is going to pay for it? I've also flown combat missions in two wars, Vietnam, Desert Storm. That's a little bit different kind of pressure. It's the same pressure our fine young men and women face today in Afghanistan and other deployments throughout the world. Will I be here to fly another day? Do any of you remember we were the first night of Desert Storm? That's the first night my wife got CNN poisoning. All the channels had the war on. Well, I remember where I was. I was in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, sitting in the cockpit of a KC-135, the military version of the Boeing 707 four-engine jet. You're a 300,000-pound flying gas station. You're going to fly along at 500 miles an hour, carrying 31,000 gallons of jet fuel. Now, that's enough jet fuel to refuel 2,000 cars. And baby, if you give them jet fuel, they're going to go fast. You're going to deliver that jet fuel to fighters flying along with you at 500 miles an hour. Stick that boom right in them. Give them that gas. Well, we made it the first night of the war. We made it the next several. But have you ever really wondered what goes on in that old cockpit? Hollywood, the movies really sensationalize it. Has anybody ever watched that classic movie, 12 O'Clock High? Great teamwork, great leadership in that movie. Or how about one of my favorite movies, The Memphis Bell? Does anybody ever want to go fly with Tom Cruise in Top Gun, huh? Huh? Yeah? Well, I can't get you with Tom, but let's just all imagine for a minute you're going to go fly a combat mission with me. It's Wednesday, February the 6th, Desert Storm. You're sitting in that cockpit right next to me. We've been airborne about an hour. It's a beautiful night, stars everywhere. It's your turn to fly. It's 45 minutes. Do we do one of these refuelings? You're cruising with the autopilot on. Hey, I get to kick back, relax, contemplate the world. I mean, you're doing a great job. Boom! We're totally out of control. What's going on? The nose of the airplane is going up and down like a teeter-totter. We're rolling from left to right like a wounded duck. You and I are sitting in the cockpit. And if we don't do something quick, we're going to be dead ducks. What do we do? we got to do something quick before the tail comes off, the wings come off. Don't tell anybody. Don't tell my crew I'm the captain. I am scared to death. I am frozen with fear. I can't move. I can't breathe. We're going down. We're crashing. There's chaos in the cockpit. Do you ever have any of those feelings when you see that new set of regulations? What do you do? All of a sudden, that little voice in the back of my mind started to talk to me. You know that little voice I'm talking about. It's that little voice that only you can hear. It never lies to you, and you can never lie to it. That little voice said, Kevin, you can't be this way. You're the captain. You have prepared for this. You can handle this in your sleep. Let's get to work. Do you have words to accurately describe what it feels like to be the captain of a 300,000-pound airplane that's totally out of control, that's crashing, and you know it? It's a feeling of overwhelming responsibility to your team, to your crew. Do you think about it in that instant? Absolutely. There's nobody else to turn to. You're the one responsible. Well, our team's emergency procedures training takes over. Back to the flight. We're going to grab that stick, kick off that autopilot, pull up those speed brakes. Whew. At least now, you and I are not going to crash immediately. But then, we see a fearful and agonizing sight. The fire lights, the fire lights in both engines on the left wing are on. They're illuminated. You and I can feel in the stick. She's too heavy to fly. We look at those engine instruments. Oh, they look like Times Square on New Year's Eve. Everything's lit up. Well, that only gives you two problems. One, we're a little bit slow. And two, we're a little bit heavy. 
But hey, other than that, it's a regular old ordinary day at the office. Do you ever have one of those days when nothing's going right? Well, I drop that nose to pick up some speed at the same time you, the other pilot, you start to dump fuel overboard to lighten our load. We say over the interphone to one of our other crew members, we go, hey, Steve, can you just kind of run on back there, scan that left wing, tell me how bad the fires are? Well, we'll get back to what actually happened a little later, but now more importantly, how do you put yourself, how do you put your team in position to deliver levels of citizen satisfaction above the citizen experience, as Simon Bailey would say, above the citizen experience your community expects? How do you have that pressure cooker confidence when you need it? Now, I've thought about this flight many times, dreamt about it, been interviewed about it. The Air Force actually put together a safety tape based on what our team did to survive. And every time I think about this flight, and every time I think about what it takes to excel in today's dynamic, challenging world, I come down to five principles. Preparation, proper preparation, passion, focus, team, and confidence. Now, when I say proper preparation, I'm not talking about being 60, 70, 80% prepared. I'm talking about you've thought of all contingencies. You've got them covered like a blanket. Passion, new regulations, stress, tighter budget. Sometimes it's a little tough to come to work, but you come to work every day with that thought to excel for the citizens of the city of Lancaster. They excel for your colleagues. Focus, focus, focus. Focus on what you can control, not on what you can't control. Team. Is this team one of the most important assets the community, the city of Lancaster has? Absolutely. You better believe it. Confidence. I'm not talking about that cocky Top Gun confidence. I'm talking about that charismatic confidence that you exude when you know that you can do the job and everybody around you knows you can do the job. They all want to be on your team. Now, why are successful people successful? Well, one of the reasons is they prepare better than anybody else. And what is preparation? Well, I knew I was going to be with a rather astute group this Friday afternoon, so I brought the dictionary definition. One, the act of preparing, making ready. Two, the state of being prepared. Three, a thing done to get ready, to make by special process. My definition, 120% commitment. Are you committed? You wouldn't be here today if you weren't committed. How do we get committed? Let's look at our flying experience as an example. I was an active duty pilot for six years, an Air National Guard weekend warrior for 17 years. And what I mean by a weekend warrior is I had a regular job, just like all of you. So I had to fly it on nights and on weekends. I had to fly a minimum of 48 times a year. Now this is the United States Air Force. Nobody flies the minimum. Everybody flies more. So I used to fly every Thursday night. The fact that I flew Thursday night was important because preparation takes time. But what's more important is what you do on those flights. You try to make yourself a better pilot every flight, continuous improvement. Every day you come to work, you try to do a 1% better job for your citizens, for your colleagues in the previous day. If you're a leader, Every employee situation you encounter, you try to do a 2 3% better job than the previous encounter. Take continuous improvement personally. It will make a difference. Now, you also have to have a little bit of fun in your job. And one of my favorite things to do is to make a little wager with the other pilot. And one of my favorite wagers was I could set a cup of coffee on the console between the two pilots, land the airplane without spilling the coffee. Okay. It was only on a training mission. The weather had to be good, not much wind. I am the captain. I determine how much coffee is in the cup. <laughs> the bet wasn't important, but what I learned from that bet, I learned to feel that airplane. Can you feel your job when it's going well? Do you ever feel it when it's not going so well? Do you ever practice for those days when it's not going so well? Sometimes I think professionally we could do a little bit better job of practicing for those tough days.
Years ago, when I got off of active duty, I was going to go to work for a large international corporation. And I was going to become a salesperson. Now, I had never been a salesperson before, so I had to take all that training. Remember the training you took your first day? Remember, hey, I hope you had a great training day here today at Lancaster University. It's a great thing. It's, a, it's unique. Everybody gets a day off and gets training in the whole city. That's great. One of the things I had to do, since I'd never been a salesperson before, I was just some old pilot, was make practice sales calls, where I'd go in this room, and there'd be an instructor. And the instructor's job was to role model the part of a client or customer. Like, they'd act like, in your case, one of your citizens. And I was supposed to go in there and sell them something. You go in there and increase their, their citizen experience. Well, most of the times, really, that was pretty easy, because I'd go in there and just close the business. The days it was tough were the days when I went in there, and the scenario that that instructor was going to play, unbeknownst to me, was they were going to be mad at me or my company. They were going to be mad at you or the city. That was the tough days. Did you ever prepare for those tough days? In the flight crew occupation, we're trained from day number one to prepare for the toughest day. Because in the flying business, if you can handle the tough days, surely you can handle the easy days. Back when I was in base pilot training, before any of us ever earned our cherished wings, one of the things we all did was go out and sit in the cockpit. And the key words are by yourself. And look at all those gates and switches, dials, knobs, circuit breakers, radar, throttles, computers, all that equipment. And then just visualize what might happen to you when you're up there flying. Then we go take an emergency procedure simulator. The fly crew occupation, along with our first responders, many of which are in the room today, and we appreciate everything you do, especially the guys that just had to leave. We appreciate that. Well, those occupations are some of the few occupations that persistently and consistently practice for the day when everything's going to go wrong. Practice for the day when you're in the bucket, the day to expect the unexpected. In the flight crew business, we'd go take an emergency procedure simulator and practice losing the engine, losing electrical power, losing hydraulic pressure, losing cabin pressure. And if that old instructor's a little bit grumpy that day, all the above at the same time. Now, trust me, that got a little bit exciting. But then one day, you're out there by yourself, and bang, something happens. That little voice, you know that little voice we talked about? That little voice only you can hear. It never lies to you, and you can never lie to it. That little voice says, this isn't pressure. You knew this day was coming. This is your opportunity to show everybody what a great pilot you are. Back at the office, in the field, or here today, when you get with all your colleagues, do you ever take the time... Or if you've got a good friend in another municipality, you ever take the time to sit down and talk about the toughest situation you ever encountered in your department, the toughest citizen you ever encountered, maybe the toughest budget you ever had to get by, what you did? Have them tell you theirs. The sole purpose of that little back and forth is when you or they are out there by yourselves and bang, something happens. That little voice will say to you, this is in pressure. You knew this day was coming. This is your opportunity to show everybody what a great asset you are, the city of Lancaster, to your colleagues. You have to have unshakable dedication. Or as Dr. Phil, the well psychologist, says, people that succeed just don't sit around and think about it, talk about it. They take meaningful, purposeful, directional action persistently and consistently. Or in my simple vernacular, I say they learn to prepare. Now, when do you learn to prepare? I think it's when you're a little kid. Think back to when you were a little kid. What'd you want to be? We just had the Oscars last, what, Sunday night? Remember we watched them? Anybody want to go out to Hollywood and be an actor, actress, win an Oscar? Hey, here down in Texas, anybody want to be a country and western singer? Be a rap singer? Be a combination of both? Hey, anybody want to be a pilot? Actually, when I was a little boy... My dream was to be a college athlete. I thought that'd be so cool, walking across campus with a letter sweater on. All the girls would love me. But it was going to be difficult, because entering high school, I was five foot, one inch tall, and 95 pounds. I couldn't make a team. 
I remember playing quarterback that first year in preseason football practice. I'm dropping back to pass. Boom, hit by one of those big, gruesome defensive linemen. Jam my shoulder into the ground. Now that is bad. And it also hurts. Well, I couldn't make a team. Entering my senior year, I'm like, how am I going to make my dream come true? I didn't want to practice what we all call is a definition of insanity. Insanity being doing the same thing every time and expecting the outcome to change. Pick your best board. Basketball. Practice every day. Start a basketball practice October 15th. All my friends laughed at me. No coach wants you. Our school's a sports powerhouse. Now, it wasn't in Texas, but it probably should have been. Our school's a sports powerhouse. Well, I didn't listen to them. I went out for that team, and I made that first cut. And I remember lying in bed at night for that final cut. I said, I'm going to make it. The next day, I got up. I got dressed. I went to school in the locker room over the bulletin board. There's the roster sheet. My name wasn't on it. I was crushed. I was devastated. My friend said, see, forget it. We told you. You know how supportive teenagers are of each other. <laughs> and I started to, but then that little voice in the back of my mind said, let me ask you a question. And I'm like, I am in no mood for any of your questions, but since I can't shut you up, what is it? That little voice said, did you properly prepare? Woo. What a question. When things aren't going your way, do you ever ask yourself that question? Nobody else needs to know the answer to it, but that's a tough question. I said, well, I played a little sandlot ball, but did I really do the things necessary to make the team? No. Well, that little voice, let me ask you one more question. I promise this is going to be the last one, okay? Are you going to give up on your life's dream knowing that you, that you didn't properly prepare? I said, I can't. I got to try one more time. What rule said you'd play in high school or play in college? There was no rule. By now, I'd finally grown to six foot two and a half, 185 pounds. I'm going to try one more time. I can remember going every night after work to that YMCA gym up on North Grand Avenue, shooting those free throws, doing those drills. Many nights, I was the only one in that gym. Well, that fall, I enrolled in the University of Missouri, and I went out for that freshman basketball team. And I said to myself, you're probably not going to get noticed. Why should they notice you? You didn't play in high school. Well, I played hard. The day before, the one and only cut, we had a scrimmage. During that scrimmage, I was assigned to guard. The next player at the University of Missouri would have given a scholarship to if many had turned down their scholarship. Hey, they noticed me. Then I realized it was him or me. Well, during that scrimmage, my opponent shot the ball three times. I blocked all three shots. Got a couple rebounds. Scored a couple times. Well, the next day was the cut. I got up. I got dressed. I started over to school. And on the way over to school, I said to myself, you're probably not going to make this team, but that's not the important life's lesson. The important life's lesson is this time you have properly prepared. This time you have been honest with yourself. Well, I got to school, in the locker room, over the bulletin board, there's the roster sheet. Woo! Baby, I made it! I'm a college athlete! Woohoo, man! <laughs> Do you know the interesting antidote to that story? Is today I wouldn't have made that team. And it's not because I'm so old. <laughs> you see, today I know too much. I know those big-time players were all-American, all state, all district, all conference. If I can't make a team, I can't compete with them. Never lose that youthful enthusiasm. Never forget the way you felt the first day on the job. Use your knowledge and your experience to your advantage. Never lose that youthful enthusiasm. I had a magnificent year. I went from being the last one to make that team becoming the sixth man on the best freshman team in the league that year before the first game. But sophomore year, the inevitable happened. The old coach retired. A new coach came in uh, as a walk-on. I was cut. Uh. you got to be willing to go the extra mile. Have you ever been in a meeting with your boss working on this project, and the boss says, this is an important project. we got to go the extra mile on this baby. Did they ever tell you what the extra mile is? 
Do you ever want to know? My wife is a master quilter. She's tell you she's not, but she is. She is 